So welcome back. This video is going to talk about the multivariate Gaussian mixture model. So you should have watched my univariate Gaussian mixture model as well as my overview of the bivariate normal distribution if you don't already know about those subjects. So I'd like to begin with an example. This is an example that we discussed back when we were breaking k-means. So here was the setup. If we go off to the right, I, I scribbled out the parameters. So we have p equal to 2 variables and k equal to 2 classes. I set this up so that the two prior probabilities were both equal to 0.5. So in this case, the black and the red distributions have equal probability of occurring. One distribution has true mean 0, 0, and the other one has true mean 2, 1. So the mean of the black distribution is off at 0, 0. The mean of the red distribution is centered at 2, comma 0. Finally, I've set it up so the, that the black distribution is spherical with equal standard deviation in both directions. So this should be a nice round cluster while the red distribution has a within correlation coefficient of 0.8. So that 0.8 is a covariance, but if you divide the covariance by the product of the standard deviations, which equals 1, it's also the co correlation. So when we ran k-means on this, k-means had a lot of problems. What it ended up doing was making a fairly small red cluster up to the right, then all of these observations that should have been red got labeled black by k-means. Consequently, what we see is that the mean for the black cluster, which should have been zero, drifted off to the right a bit and drifted down. So we get a minus 0.8. So this thing sort of drifted southeast to swallow up all those red observations. Let's go estimate this with a Gaussian mixture. To do that, we'll use the mclus library, just as we did with the old faithful data and my other contrived data set. I'm going to specify that I want two clusters. mclus uses big G instead of big K for the number of clusters. You just have to live with that. If we plot the fitted object, we get several plots with one of them off to the right. So this plot is actually showing the uncertainty. So what is uncertainty? Well, the uncertainty of an observation is 1 minus the largest posterior probability. So to make sense of this, let's take a look at a few observations. Consider this blue dot out here. So the posterior probability that this point is blue will be close to 1. So there's almost no chance that, that, the, that this observation could have arisen from the red distribution. So the probability that this is blue given the x value is like 0.999 something or other. The probability that this is really from the red distribution would be about 0 0.000 something or other. So 1 minus the largest value will be close to 0. The diameter of the point is going to be proportional to that uncertainty. So that's why the diameter is so small. Let's go take a look at one of these red observations off in the upper right. Again, the uncertainty is going to be very small. So given the x, the probability that this is red will be close to 1. The probability that this comes from the blue distribution will be close to 0. Therefore, 1 minus the largest posterior probability will also be close to 0, and that's why the diameter is so small. All the observations down in this area are very large reflecting a lot of uncertainty. So let's just take where I've got my, my mouse pointed. This one clearly has a posterior probability that is larger for the red distribution, but I would guess it's close to 0.5. So let's say it's 0.51, which means the probability that that observation came from the blue distribution is 0.49. So the uncertainty of this observation would be 1 minus 0.51, which is about 0.49. That's clearly signaling that we're not that certain about that observation. It could be red. It could almost as likely have come from the blue distribution. Well, now let's go take a look at the 
actual parameter estimate. So fit dollar parameter gives those estimates. Pro, you'll remember, probably stands for proportion. These are the priors. You'll remember that I chose the priors to both equal 0.5, and they're fairly close to that. The mean component of this gives a P by K matrix of means. So you remember the true mean for the left distribution was zero, zero. Well, we're close. Maybe we're, we're a bit off in the X2 direction. The true mean for the second class was two, zero. Well, we're a little bit over and a little bit over in, in both cases. If I were to let the sample size grow, so with say a thousand observations instead of 200, I would expect these to converge to the true values. Fit dollar parameters, dollar variance, dollar sigma, actually gives the covariance matrices for the two classes. So the first part is gonna be the covariance matrix of the blues. The second will be the covariance matrix for the red. Now remember that a correlation coefficient is equal to the covariance between say x1 and x2 divided by sigma one, sigma two. So I'd much rather interpret a correlation coefficient because those are bounded between minus one and positive one than a covariance because I don't really know what big is. It's, it's all relative to the standard deviation. Well, R has a very nice function built in called cub to core. So cub to core takes a covariance matrix and converts it to a correlation matrix. For example, so where does this correlation of minus 0.27 come from? Well, it should be this covariance divided by the square root of the diagonal elements. So I just scribbled that down right here. So this should equal minus 0.27. So the Gaussian mixture model has estimated some correlation between x1 and x2 in class one. That should be zero. Again, if, um, if my sample size, if I used a larger sample, this would get closer and closer to zero. The correct correlation of the red distribution should be 0.8. Well, we're pretty close when we get 0.83-ish. So again, I find that easier to interpret than a, than a covariance of 1.1. That's relative to these two standard deviations. Another plot that comes out of this is the unconditional distribution. So this is the mixture factoring in the priors with the class conditional distributions and shows two modes. We can do exactly the same thing in Python. Python doesn't have a cov to core function, but it's easy enough to write one yourself. And so you get pretty similar estimates when you use the Python sklearn library. Here are the means, here are the covariances. We can apply cov to core to them and then the Gaussian mixture weights are the priors. Notice these priors are substantially different than 0.5. In general, my experience between the R and the Python library is that the R library tends to do a bit better than the Python library. There might be some additional parameters we can set. Maybe the convergence criteria hasn't been uh, made small enough. Perhaps we haven't had enough iterations by default. But uh, in general, I find the default settings in R to be a bit better. On the other hand, the algorithm used to estimate it is different in Python than R, and Python in general can handle larger data sets than the uh, R implementation of Gaussian mixtures. The problem we've just studied is fairly easy in that there are only two variables, and therefore our correlation matrices are pretty small. Each one of these correlation matrices has three elements in it. Therefore, the number of parameters does not grow very quickly. So we have a modest number of parameters to estimate. If we count the parameters, we have one prior, we have four means, and we have six variance 
covariance estimates. So this is a total of 11 parameters. When P grows, however, we're going to have a problem because these covariance matrices are going to get much bigger. So for P equal to 3, my covariance matrix is going to look like this. which has six parameters. In general, we have P times 1 plus P over 2 variances per cluster. So the number of variance terms grows quadratically with P. So if P is even moderately large, we are not going to be able to estimate the full covariance matrix. So as a consequence, Gaussian mixture software will allow you to specify a restricted version of these correlation matrices. When it comes to specifying the models, I actually prefer the Python implementation over the R implementation. Python only offers you four options, and that's, um, that's probably all, the, all that you need. The M plus library in R offers you many more to the point where it's just confusing. So let's go take a look at the four options offered by Python. The first is called spherical. This is a picture from the Python documentation, and I think this diagram shows what spherical means very clearly. What we see is round clusters of different sizes. So the way to think about this is sigma sub k is equal to, so sigma sub k, the covariance matrix of cluster k, is going to be some little sigma sub k times the identity matrix. So this is the recipe for generating a spherical cluster. This says we're going to allow different clusters to have different variances. So what I'd like to point out is that if you have k clusters, you're going to only have k, param k variance parameters to estimate. That grows very modestly. The diag option looks like this. Each cluster can have a different set of variances in both directions, but the clusters are aligned with the coordinate axes. So it looks like cluster 1 is perfectly round up here, the orange cluster has more variance in the x1 direction than in the x2 direction, but there's no within cluster correlation, likewise with the light blue cluster. So diag is going to look something like this. Sigma sub k is going to be sigma k1 through sigma kp, and we're going to have zeros off the diagonal. So the total number of variance parameters that you're going to have to estimate will be however many clusters you have k times the number of dimensions that you have p. So the number of parameters will grow linearly with both p and k. The third option that Python offers is called tied. And what they mean by this is they're going to allow for correlations, but these correlations are constrained to be the same in all of the clusters. So tied will give a correlation matrix that looks something like this, sigma 1 squared through sigma p squared, and then we have the full set of correlations off the diagonal. So the num total number of parameters will just be p times 1 plus p over 2, and that's what I wrote up here. Full is where we allow every cluster to have its own correlation matrix. So sigma sub k is going to be sigma k1 squared through sigma kp squared, sigma kij as the off-diagonal element. So notice one cluster has p times 1 plus p over two terms, but I have k of those, so that's going to be the total number of variance parameters that I have to estimate. So you can tell Python which set of covariances you want. Let's now look at how mclust handles this. mclust uses an eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. We're going to talk a lot more about this eigen decomposition when we get to the 
dimensionality reduction section, think of lambda sub k as a scaling factor. In the Python example, I use sigma sub k as the scaling factor that said how big the variances are going to be across the board. M cluster is going to use lambda sub k for that. Matrix D is a rotation matrix that rotates the elliptical contours. So without D, you're going to end up with zeros off the diagonal. And that's going to simplify your life a lot. If you allow for these D matrices, then you can rotate the ellipse. Finally, these A's are going to determine the lengths of the axes. Those A's are like these sigmas. So if you think about the length of this major axis is going to be sigma 1, the length of this major axis is going to be sigma 2, those are going to be like those A vectors. So in total, there's something like 16 of these models that R will fit for you. I think it's useful to just talk about a handful. So let's start with the first two. EII and VII both specify spherical distributions. So EII says all the clusters have to be spherical and they share a variance parameter. So this is not something offered by Python. So this is implicitly what's assumed by k-means. The only difference between EII and k-means is that the Gaussian mixture model with the EII allows for unequal priors, whereas k-means is going to be biased towards having equal cluster sizes. VII is exactly like we had with spherical, where all the clusters are round, but they have different variances. So this cluster is very compact, whereas this other cluster has a comparatively large variance. So EII and VII assume spherical clusters. There's another four models that allow for covariance matrices with zeros in the off-diagonal positions. So to understand these, I've drawn some simple pictures here. EEI means that all the clusters have the exact same shape and size, but we're going to allow more variance in one direction than the other. So in, in this example, I've rigged it so that there's more variance in the x2 direction than the x1 direction that's something that would be estimated by the model. So we could also have clusters that are elongated in the x1 direction as long as all four clusters look exactly the same. VEI, on the other hand, allows for the four clusters to have different scaling parameters, but they all have to have the same orientation. VBI, on the other hand, allows all the clusters to have different orientations and scalings. However, all the off-diagonal elements have to be zero. So VVI is the equivalent of diag in Python. Finally, EEE and VVV allow for within-cluster correlations. EEE is the same as tied in Python. VVV is the same as full in Python. Let's now apply the Gaussian mixture to the newspaper example. I thought I would do this one live, so I just read in the data. Let's go fit the Gaussian mixture. You're going to see that this is computationally fairly hard, so that probably took a second to estimate. It wasn't instantaneous. Now, if I plot a fitted object, you're going to see I get a menu. The first plot gives the BIC statistic for all of the different models that R has tried. We like to have large BIC values. So what that means is negative values closer to zero are better than negative values further from zero. And what R has done is selected the EEV model. So if I hit two, we can see the estimated ellipsoids as well as the, along with which cluster each point gets assigned to. Three gives us the uncertainty plots. So as we would expect, all the points in between clusters have a lot of uncertainty. All the points far from other clusters have 
a lot of certainty. And then the fourth plot gives us the unconditional density for the joint distribution. Now what's kind of interesting about this plot is that the latest version of the software actually gives something different than an older version of the software. The older version gave a plot that is a little more interesting to look at, and so I'd like to discuss that here. So this is the old solution that MCLUST gave. So I like to use this plot as an illustration of overfitting. What does it mean for a Gaussian mixture model to overfit the data? Well, ordinarily when we overfit, that means we have too many parameters in the model and therefore we, um, we capture noise as opposed to signal. Let's consider these points. They all have time equal to five. However, if the number of sections is also five, I call you a heavy reader. If the number of sections goes up to six, I call you a skimmer. And if the number of sections is seven, I call you a heavy reader again. Well, from a practical point of view, that's nonsense. Why would we call someone who only reads five sections heavy, yet someone who reads six sections a light reader? The problem is with the elongated cluster, this observation is a higher posterior probability of coming from this cluster than from the heavy readers cluster. I think we've overfitted the data by having too many variance parameters. We'd almost be better off with k-means in this case. I've given you the Python code below. Let me wrap up with a few summary comments. So k-means imposes a lot of constraints on, on the shape of the clusters. It wants round clusters of equal size. Gaussian mixtures relaxes those assumptions. The problem with Gaussian mixtures is you need to choose the right level of complexity for your covariances. So how much flexibility do you need when you estimate those covariance matrices? That's going to require you to make a decision. The Gaussian mixture models are also substantially more complicated to estimate than the k-means models. And so what you'll find is that you can easily throw tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cases at k-means and have it run on your laptop. You're not going to be able to do that with Gaussian mixtures.